12.50 in Sydney. Um, I think we should get started. So good afternoon. Thanks for joining this workshop. So my name is Stuart Seal. I'm a partner solutions consultant with New Relic based out of Singapore. So my workshop today is about observability. And at New Relic, our goal is to make observability a daily practice for engineers and developers at every stage of the software life cycle. And we do this by making instrumentation as frictionless as possible for the developers and the engineers so that they can easily you know, explore the data regarding the performance and reliability of the applications, the, their APIs that they're building and, and troubleshoot the software. So my, my goal in this session is to share with you um, what's required for observability, some of the best practices around uh, incorporating observability into your software uh, life cycle and how you can actually use it to build better software. So when you incorporate observability, especially when you're trying to move fast on the cloud, right? You know, you want to make sure that the, your software is actually delivering the, the outcomes that is expected. So let, let's start by understanding a bit better about uh, observability. Um, so observability is how well you understand your complex system, right? So in, in modern software environment, we consider observability as providing a connected real-time view of all your data, you know, including performance data, um, availability data, all in one place in order to help you pinpoint issues faster um, and then to understand what caused an issue and, and why it caused the issue, right? And also very importantly, to proactively tie the data that you are gathering to the business outcomes that, that the business is expecting. Right, so you probably heard about, I mean, observability and, and monitoring has been around for a long time, right? And, and you know, probably heard about solutions like business service management, operation analytics, and they're all trying to achieve very similar outcome, right? But we kind of view observability as the next evolution of uh, in monitoring. So where we look to analyze different types of telemetry data and, and incorporating, you know, the monitoring ideally automatically through the software life cycle, right? So traditionally, you know, with uh, application performance monitoring, we will be tracking performance metrics and, and events like, you know, transactions that are happening and then looking at the transaction traces, right? And, and now as we, you know, as we move to the cloud and start to deal with microservices, um, you know, we want to start looking at distributed traces, you know, want to start looking at logs to be able to like troubleshoot faster, right? Together with all these same metrics that we've been gathering, right? And, and this is kind of how, how observability is different from, from monitoring. You know, we want to expand what we are, what, we, what the data that we have access to, right? And, and also to, able, to be able to un understand the why as well as, you know, proactively tie all this information to the, um, you know, to the complete software stack and then providing the, you know, the business value uh, of that data, right? So we hear, commonly hear the term called full stack observability, and which is what I'm going to share with you um, today. So if we look at, uh, you know, um, how full stack observability can help an organization move fast on the cloud, right? You know, and while minimizing the, the cost and the risk associated with, with um, getting onto the cloud. So essentially you are, you are changing the, the fiber of your application architecture, right? So you, you're looking at uh, the composing monolithic application to microservices, you're looking at leveraging managed database services, for instance, instead of self-hosting them, right? And having your applications run in containerized Kubernetes cluster as opposed to the standard uh, virtual machines. So, so taking the right approach to cloud observability can, can help to ensure you have that com comprehensive visibility into your cloud native environment, right? And potentially, helping you to guarantee the positive outcomes, you know, without necessary, uh, necessary provide, you know, providing, creating the risk to your performance and, and your agility, right? So across 
um, our customers, we, we, we have a few core fundamentals in, in adopting the cloud. And, and this, is, this is to actually make it easy for, for them to, to adopt these new cloud services easily, right? And then as they, as they move along to actually experiment with the, with the new technology, the new services, you know, hopefully without any risk, and then as their demand grow for their services, you know, to actually make sure that, you know, they're able to scale without, um, you know, um, having their costs running away, right? So, so we, with each of these capabilities, you know, the KPIs that you see listed on the screen here, like availability, deployment frequency, this, this are really a good start to measure success of how you are doing on your cloud journey, right? But Essentially, each organization should determine for themselves what to measure and kind of set their own target, right, based on their business environment. And th this measurement should be what the good possibility platform can provide. So what I want to do now is to actually look at some examples of dashboards or reports that you can potentially use, you know, to observe how well you're doing for each of these capabilities as you move to the cloud, you know, as you transform the way you build your APIs essentially incorporating you know, an observability practice within your software development life cycle. So switching to um, the New Relic UI, right? So here you can see um, you know, how we are tracking um, the different services in, you know, that, that we, are, we are running, right? So this, this is part of the initial capability of uh, you know, trying to make sure that we can adopt easily, right? So we want to be able to, first of all, establish ob objectives and, and, and baseline, right? So, so as to be able to compare like the before and the after, right? And then, you know, ad adopting these, these services, uh, like the, um, you know, database services, as well as things like the uh, um, serverless functions, and then to be able to, to tune them to, to our needs, right? And, and then finally, you know, from the data, decide what services that we should migrate, right? So on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see that, uh, you know, um, this is the duration that we have for our monolith, monolith uh, application, you know, the average response time and being able to compare that with the, uh, you know, the, the same application that we, we run using um, uh, microservices. Right, and then looking at the you know the latency of all the different services within that um, you know the application, looking at the the throughput for all the different services, right, um, and then looking at all the different transactions within the uh, um, the services, whether it is from the uh, you know the the uh, the monolith as well as from the from the microservice, right. So, so once we are able to, to adopt all these um, services and then migrate to the cloud, right, then we want to be able to um, start, um, you know, to experiment more confidently, right? And, and to be able to do that, you know, we want to be able to, to kind of make sure that we, we have a handle on, on problems that might occur as we make changes to, to our environment, right? Making sure that we have the um, appropriate alerting in place, right, on the key performance indicator that we're tracking, you know, to be able to measure the impact of changes and the deployments that we're making, all right, and then having the ability to, to try and troubleshoot the environment, all right. So here you see on the right-hand side, you know, we are tracking the, the mean time to resolution, you know, and, and you know, here we're seeing an increase in the, the time it takes to resolve, right, and, and so that's something that we we need to be able to, to do better in terms of like, you know, um, uh, getting alert, uh, alerted earlier and be able to troubleshoot uh, faster, right? So I, I want to kind of switch to another view where we, where we use um, observability to try and understand, um, you know, what, what deployment we've, we've um, we've put into, in, into place against an, an application. So here we're looking at what we call a planned service of which is part of an, an application for, uh, you know, subscribing to, to mobile phones and selecting uh, a, a mobile subscription plan, right? 
And here you can see in the past 24 hours, the web transaction response time for, for this planned service, we're seeing a peak here, right? And at the same time, we can look at the, the throughput and kind of correlate the, you know, the response time to the throughput, you know, and seeing that as well as the error, uh, the error rates and, and, and the attack score, right? And here we're seeing that, you know, uh, when, when the response time is slow, the throughput hasn't really increased much, right? And neither has the, the error rate, right? And we can kind of drill down really quickly, you know, into this, um, this, this time where, you know, things start to become slow and we can see that, you know, the, the blue portion represent, uh, representing the, the PHP code, the yellow bit representing the, the, the database uh, request response time, right? And they, they're all increasing at this point of, of time, right? And what you're seeing with the, the light yellow color is actually showing a warning violation that we've actually have uh, the web response time exceeding 500 milliseconds for more than five minutes, right? And then the, the darker yellow or the brownish color kind of showing a, a critical response time, a critical violation for the response time exceeding 700 milliseconds, right? So this clearly shows that there was a problem. And what you see here with the with the, the line showing above here is that this person, G. Parker, he actually deployed a, a package or something to, to optimize database query. Right, and and when he start started doing that, the response time started to become slow. There was that warning violation, and then there was the critical violation, and then at this point, that that vertical line represent, if I can get to it, uh, but you can see the same thing here, right? You know, um, that which is at this two forty p.m., two forty forty p.m. here, showing that he's trying to fix the the bad query, right, which is represented by this line here. Right, and seeing that the the revision that he put in wasn't helping much, he decided to um, you know to roll back the uh, the um, the deployment, right? And immediately after that, the response time start to come down, right? So so without looking at like you know like the detailed transaction trace and and things like logging to to help troubleshoot, right? From from this view, we can very quickly understand you know that. Um, you know, a deployment change is actually affecting the, the response time, right? And we can very quickly go ahead and, and um, you know, uh, back it out and then get the, 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 the response back to normal, right? So, so what we provide with observability in, in New Relic is to provide different workflows, you know, to help with different types of troubleshooting, you know, so that we can, we can reduce the mean time to resolution, which is what we're trying to do back here. Right. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So, so then you know, after we we are able to uh, you know, we've done all the experiment to try out the different services and how you can optimize the uh, the uh, performance and reliability of the application. Right. That's where we start to look at scaling uh, our application. Right. You know, moving to a containerized environment with with uh, with uh, things like Kubernetes. And then also looking at how, you know, how we can optimize the, the customer experience, right? So we, we, we've got something set up and not all customers will be experiencing the same kind of reliability or uh, performance as they, as they uh, you know, access the application from, from different locations, for instance, right? So, so then, you know, trying to optimize the, you know, as we scale, right, you know, using more cloud services, we, we need to look at whether we are optimizing that, that resource that we put in, right? You know, in terms of like, um, you know, are we over provisioning the, the, the sizes of the, of the services that, that, um, that we have running, right? So here we are looking at like the node um, transaction pressure, you know, measured in terms of the, the number of transaction against the node, um, you know, and also for a, a Kubernetes uh, a cluster, you know, the, the number of transactions um, hitting the uh, a particular port, right? And, and down here, we are looking at the, uh, you know, the application response time uh, from different location, right? And maybe there's something, if, if, the, if the response time is, is, is different from 
um, locations that are far away from our, you know, where we're hosting the, the, the application, maybe we need to look at, uh, you know, CDNs or, or kind of distributing our application across uh, multiple, um, you know, availability zones, for instance, right? And, you know, with the changes that we're making, looking at tracking the percentage of failed transactions, for instance, right? And, you know, seeing if there's a trend that uh, we, we are getting less failed transaction. And, you know, with, uh, with moving to the cloud, very importantly, kind of tracking our cloud costs, right? You know, whether we are, we are uh, over our exceeding our, our, our budget. Right, so there, there are lots of different views that we can provide to um, you know um, to different stakeholders across the um, in, um, you know across the software uh, life cycle, right? You know, the, so the previous dashboard that I showed you was more focused on on cloud um, services. So as you see across the the top here, this is more focused around the the different stakeholders for the service that we are observing. Um, or for the service that we're observing, right? So starting with the developer view, right? So developers are concerned with the kind of the page performance. So they're, of course, they're front end and back end developers, right? So, you know, front end developers, they are looking at, uh, um, you know, page response time, you know, the, um, the DOM processing, the page rendering for the different, um, you know, transactions or, or URL, right? Um, and then with, uh, you know, dynamic single page application, looking at the, the performance of the, uh, um, the AJAX requests, right? Um, and further down, looking at like the, uh, you know, the response time, uh, you know, the different uh, browser, whether they have an effect on the, the page response time. Um, so you can see, uh, you know, Safari taking a longer time compared to things like uh, uh, Firefox and IE on the mobile, okay? So yeah, so lots of different telemetry data we can, we can report for, uh, for, for the developers to help them um, with their, with their de uh, development. Uh, we can look at IT operation as well, looking at the, um, you know, the application performance score. So we track something like what we, what we call an, an app deck score, which is kind of, a, a, a performance measure of of how the you know the the, the response time of of a, a web page um, you know comparing like taking a ratio of the the acceptable or satisfactory uh, response time and uh, versus the uh, response time that are kind of uh, frustrating right for you know uh, taking kind of four times the 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 threshold that we set right and calculating a value. For the for the overall score of the performance, um, looking at the external uptime, you know, CPU utilization, yeah, fairly similar things for you know for development as well, but applying that to uh, for the operation team, right? Things like uptime errors by server, you know, um, up uptime for the for the one month, for instance. Right. So in terms of uh, for DevOps productivity, we're looking at like deployment um, efficiency um, as well as uh, operational efficiency. Right. So looking at things like, you know, successful uh, release percent production, you know, release to staging versus rollback. Um, yeah. So more to do with uh, uh, deployment uh, efficiency as well as then looking at the further down the operational efficiency, right? Looking at the successful versus fail builds, um, you know, throughput, looking at the performance of the the, the uh, app decks across the different zones, as I mentioned earlier on, the satisfactory ones, the, um, the frustrated ones and the failed ones, right? So I'm, I'm gonna pause here and see if there's any questions um, or anybody has any comments about this, what I'm showing you so far. All right, if not, what I'm gonna do now is to actually um, go back to my slide and show you an example of a 
a um, an observe what I call an observable calculator service, right? So I've, I've built an, a a simple application, right? That is uh, that is running um, on on Lambda, right? So I've got a calculator uh, function that is written in Python that is running on AWS Lambda, right? And this this uh, this is invoked through a an API gateway um, on, on on AWS, and then a uh, a front end um, application written in in PHP that's going to allow us allow me to to input a couple of numbers, and then you know the calculator is going to do some simple arithmetic to you know calculate the sum, the, the difference um, of of the two numbers I enter, and as well as that, I'm going to end. It allows me to enter the the, the API uh, URL so that I can test this uh, this um, API request and then look at the observability that I can get with this simple function, right? So with the PHP app, you know what I've done is to actually instrument it with an app, uh, uh, application performance monitoring agent, and that allows me to look at the um, you know the transaction breakdown and then send a distributed trace through the, um, you know, through the different um, services here, right? But at the same time, what, I'm, what I've also done is to, is to collect the logs of this uh, calculator function, right? Each time you invoke this calculator function, it's going to, it's going to log um, an output to the, to the CloudWatch log group. And then separately, there is, you know, we've installed a, a, a new relic log injection function that is triggered by whenever this function writes to a certain log group, right? So that that fun, that the the injection log injection function will then send the the logs from from this logs group to the uh, new relic, and at the same time, it's going to inject some some trace information, right? That allows me to then do what we call logs in context to provide the the person that's doing uh, the troubleshooting to just look at logs for that particular request rather than logs for all the requests as well as logs for you know maybe the the the, the os and and other things right and for this function what i've also done is to actually um, instrument it so that i can send um, trace information as well as custom events about what this function is doing right so so enough talk about that. Let's let's look at what I can actually see within the uh, um, the observability platform itself. Right. So let me switch to a different different UI. So so I'm going to simulate, you know, with the with the PHP app, simulate a number of uh, requests and specifying the API gateway URL, right? So that you know you can then see what we are monitoring or tracking at the, on on for the runtime as well as the you know the 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 traces and the logs that are are produced so so this is working is is generating you know an output for the two numbers uh sending it sending it to this url right um and i'm going to put in a a instead of a number a string right so with the x there and it, it's going to fail right because it's saying that i'm expecting a number and you're sending something like 10x which is a, a string and that's why i i, I can't I can do it, right? And I'm just going to run it again, and then um, you know, then it's working again, right? Okay. So what happens with this uh, on on the AWS side of, of the of uh, the Lambda side of of the uh, of the system, right? Just quickly show you what the calculator function is doing. So the API gateway is is will invoke the uh, the calculator function. And you know, just quickly looking at the at the code for the uh, for the function, um, it's, it's very simple code, right? So what, what essentially what it's doing is just taking some numbers and and doing uh, you know the uh, the arithmetic on it and then returning that that uh, that information, right? But what we have added as part of the instrumentation is to accept the uh, the distributed trace payload. So that we know that you know we want to track um, the the trace to this lambda function, right? And at the same time, what I've done is to actually record a, a custom event to say that you know um, 
record a custom event called NRC account and then send this a uh, 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 number of parameters. And and this is how we would use this in, in real life is to like when say in, in the e-commerce application, you know, if the customer adds certain things to, to a card and then submit that for, you know, uh, for payment or, or purchase, right? So we can track that that request, you know, as, as a as a you know as a custom event. Okay. So um so if we go back to um, New Relic and see what we can see, right? So I've created a dashboard. And if I look at what happens in the last 30 minutes, okay, you can see that, you know, I've drawn a service map, right? Of the, it's a bit small, but, uh, you know, this service map is essentially showing the PHP, the browser calling the PHP app and then calling the, uh, the URL request, right, of the uh, of the API call, right? So I did three invocation. You know, the first time was okay. The second time I put in the string. The third time I put in a a uh, a good you know two numbers again. So the three invocation, and essentially because I haven't been using that lambda function for a while, it had to do a cold start, right? So we know that that um, that lambda function woke up, right? And then looking at here, there's a custom event, right? Okay, so I've I've done it three times, but one time failed, so I didn't send the the custom event for the uh, the the failed uh, required. So I'm seeing the two um, two uh, custom event, right? So looking at the error rate, you know there was one error here, and then this is the throughput, right? But further down, you can look at you know I've actually made three requests through the API gateway, and then at the same time looking at the logs. Right, so this kind of a dashboard we can <clears throat> we can uh, produce so that we can get you know very very comprehensive visibility into that function that that um, you know I just described, right? But we can also go deeper and look at you know what happens within that uh, that calculator function, right? So um, so here I'm looking at the the lambda function, right? Um, so looking at the calculator function. Is something that was instrumented. Um, so you see that I invoked it three times. Okay, nothing new here. But if then I look at the distributed tracing, right, and I click on this index PHP. Okay, so just picking the one that has got an error. So on the right hand side here, you can see that there's those are the three functions that are invoked, right? So the middle one has got two errors. Right. Um, so let me just click on that. So this view is make, makes it very easy for us to to select the you know the trace because potentially in, in real life there's going to be lots and lots of traces, right? So the vertical axis here is the trace duration of, and of course we can sort it by by different um, uh, different metric, right? So you know there, there is one that is really slow, kind of an outlier, right? So you know that that happened here, right? and it, and this is actually because of the cold start. Right, and that's why it took longer, right? So, so that you know really tells the story. But what I wanted to show you was this the trace um, for this transaction here, right? So you can see um, that is this PHP app, the calculator app, making a call to the lambda function, but um, within that PHP app, it's making a request to this uh, um, API URL, right? And then within the uh, lambda function that is calling, there was an error. If I click on that, you know, I can see the error details that, yeah, there was a, a, a value error. And here is actually telling me, you know, it should be a number, but I put in 10x, right? And you can look at information about this particular uh, transaction easily, right? Okay, so look at the attributes of the, the lambda request and some of the details about the, the the function itself, right? So it's actually a, a lambda agent, right? But you know, in in, in real life, the the um, the the function could be a, a lot more complicated. You know, there there will be uh, we will be tracking, we'll be writing logs for this this service as well, and and to help us to troubleshoot the problem very quickly, you can see that we can refer to the logs here uh, very easily. Right, so if I click on logs, 
you know, that, that's going to bring me to the uh, what I call what we call locks in context, right? So these are just the locks that are specific uh, to this uh, to this transaction, right? Um, and you can see that we've actually uh, embedded a number of different things into the um, into into the logs, right? So that we can actually query them and 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 track them easily, right? So if I br bring you to a different view of the um, of the of our log UI, okay, you can see that you know I'm automatically filtering by the lambda request ID, right? Which is what we embed into the the logs that is generated and sent to New Relic, right? So these are all the you know the five uh, logs that you saw earlier on. Uh, when I when I trigger the the transaction with a field, um, you know, with a string instead of a number, right? And we can go in and, and look at the details of of the logs, right? Um, you know, that's that's the actual message that was uh, uh, sent by the by the uh, written by the lambda function to the to the log group, right? So when when you have a lot of logs, you know, uh, log records, then there is all this. Um, you know, uh, features that you can actually click to say, look at surrounding locks, right? You know, so for this particular error, if I click on sur surrounding locks, it will bring me back here and then look at surrounding locks that are related to this particular, um, to, to this particular error. Okay, so, um, so, so that's so much I wanted to show for my simple calculator function. Um, is there any questions? So I can take, let me see if there's anything on the chat. Looks like we've got a fairly quiet audience here. But oh, fine, let's move forward. <clears throat> okay, so, so that was a very simple one. What I'm going to show you um, is a, a more complex um, um, API request, right? Um, okay, so sorry, going back here. So this is a more uh, sophisticated uh, Lambda function, right? Um, kind of very similar to what I do, I did, but uh, um, you know, it's, it's, it's part of a more uh, distributed uh, application. And here you can see that, uh, you know, there's a lot, lot more invocation of this, uh, of this, this function, right? And then if I start looking at this uh, distributed tracing, you see that, you know, there's, there's a lot of different um, errors that I'm seeing here. And if I pick on one that has got more errors, Right, and then drilling down into that, that particular trace. So, so what you see is a, a more, uh, you know, more com complex distributed um, application, right? Um, so starting with the, the web portal, which is a, um, so I think this is a, a Java application, right? Uh, we can click on it and look at see what it is. Right, so yeah, it's a Java application. You can see the response time for, for that particular web portal, the throughput, the error rates, right? And it's actually part of, uh, you know, 20 different workloads, you know, and we are actually monitoring with, with different synthetic monitors, right? And, and for this particular trace, it's actually calling the fulfillment service, which then calls, you know, billing service, calling that Lambda function, um, as well as, uh, you know, further down the, uh, the payment credit card um, service, right? And we can click on each on one of these, right? So, so this is kind of a uh, what we call a polyglot um, um, application where you know all the different services here are actually written in different um, different languages, right? So here we have a a Ruby application, right? Um, and then the, the billing service, I think, is something else. It's actually a, a Python application, right? A Python service, right? 
So similarly, if I click on the, the error, you know, we can see here is a different error. Um, yeah, expecting a different types of a uh, uh, parameter, right? So now, if I go and look at the logs, that will help me with uh, you know speeding up my my troubleshooting. All right, so just going to show you the uh, the UI for the for the logs. So you see now we are getting logs for the the different services, right? Under here, the web portal, the fulfillment services, right? And yeah, and this is the lambda. The lambda doesn't have a service, right? And and we can actually show the uh, the the lambda request ID, and this is what will appear here, right? Um, for for the uh, for the lambda um, logs, right? So what, what you see here, what we're trying to do here is that you know as we when we come into this uh, into this screen to look to, to look at the logs, we're actually filtering by the you know the lambda function, right? The request ID and then the trace ID for the different um, services, right? So we're getting just the logs pertaining to that uh, to that uh, uh, transaction. That traverses the you know the different services here. Okay, um, so so that was pretty easy, I think. Um, any questions so far? Yeah, the other type of monitoring that people typically would do if we go back to my. My simple calculator function, right, is um, are things like synthetic monitors, right? So my for my calculator function, what I've done, although I've uh, disabled them, so they are really, you know, kind of two types of uh, uh, synthetic monitor that we can run to, um, you know, to track the performance and availability of our of, of our API. So if I start by looking at the um, the scripted API. Okay, so this, so here we can, so I'm not running it, so this is not showing anything. So, but if I if I go to the script, yeah, so this is a, the, the same, similar things to what the, the PHP application is doing. I'm specifying the uh, API URL, Providing a JSON with a couple of numbers, right, and then and then coding the the callback function, um, you know, with the uh, with the to to get the expected results, right. So I've kind of hard coded like I'm inputting a number one and two, and I should get a sum of three. And if the if the the API works properly, I should get three, right, as a sum of the two numbers, right. So if I've Click on it to do the validation, and then what this synthetic monitor does is that you know you can schedule it to run um, on a on a on a regular basis, and then schedule it to run from multiple location, right? So this is running from uh, a point of presence I have in, uh, in in Hong Kong, right? So what you see then is that that script, you know, ran successfully, and it took one point eight second, and I can. Look at the the breakdown of the of the time it took, right? You know the uh, the status is getting a two hundred, right? And then looking at looking at the uh, you know the breakdown of the, the the TCP as well as the HTTP request, right? The connect time, the DNS, you know if there's any uh, SSL handshaking, right? Okay, so that we we can you know we can have a good idea of how to tune this uh, uh, this API request, okay? So the other way of doing this, um, if you don't want to write in JavaScript, right, is to use a, a recorder, right? So, so what I've done here is to actually record this UI, right, with a, a Selenium um, uh, IDE and <clears throat> And this is the script that I can um, that I get, and then I just format it for you know to to work with with New Relic, right? So so that is the the, the script that you can you can record, and then um, 
you know, do checkings of uh, the, the returns and all, right? So same thing, I can validate it, you know, and this, this will have some elements of, of, the, of the UI because this is running the, uh, the you know, the, the PHP uh, uh, um, front end, right? So, so here you can see that there is JavaScript running, there is um, downloading any image, you know, uh, executing some HTML, right? So kind of the, the, the waterfall model. Okay, so I mean, this is uh, examples of how people test their test their API, right? And and in, and in reality, right? What what you actually do is, you know, if your API is returning a a series of URL, you 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 probably don't want to just check for the you know the, the status of the the API. You may want to actually check the um, you know whether that that series look through the series of uh, URL that are are returned. And see whether they, you know, they they are actually uh, um, available and, and returning the right uh, value for your mobile apps or, or your your browser application. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is to um, switch to switch to an infrastructure service, right? So um, pretty common, you know, a lot of of our customers are are moving to to Kubernetes cluster so that they can actually scale their you know scale their their, their micro application uh, running on microservice uh, services a lot better, right? And you may have heard about the buzz around uh, Pixie, right? Which is uh, um, and also possibly uh, eBPF, right? So. So Pixie was is a is something that uh, New Relic acquired last year, and we contributed that to the uh, the CNCF as a sandbox project in in the middle of this year, right? And on the other hand, um, let me just switch to the Kubernetes cluster view, right? And on the hand, eBPF is something that we can use to automatically capture um, telemetry data without the need for any manual instrumentation. You know, so that we can provide instant visibility into the uh, the Kubernetes workload, right? And, and and before Pixie, what you had to do was to, if you want to see the uh, the services that are running in in all these nodes, right? You would need to instrument somehow instrument the services with, with an APM or, or or language agents, right? So so let's start by looking at this uh, this Kubernetes cluster. Right, and then you know we can look at drilling down into the, to the ports and and, and the different um, services. Okay, so so this is the view of a, a Kubernetes cluster, right? So you can see here, you know, the the two hemispheres represent the, the the two nodes that are, are part of this uh, the cluster, you know, and, and we can look at um, the the control plane, you know, right down to the the ports that are. Uh, are running as well as the ports that are, um, you know, alerting and potentially ports that are uh, pending, right? So I don't have anything that are pending here, but then you know, um, pot potentially you know you you get ports that are uh, looking looking to download an image that that they cannot find, so you know, so it's stuck here, or even ports that are um, um, that the uh, the control the you know that cannot be assigned to any particular node because of a uh, uh, resource uh, limitation, right? So if we look at, an, so, so, so looking at the, the cluster, you know, just if we look at the nodes themselves, right? So here we are looking at the, the resource utilization for the nodes, right? And so you have the CPU, the memory, the, the storage availability, as well as the, uh, the percentage of uh, allocatable uh, ports that are um, you know, that are either available or, or um, you know, that are, are used, right? Okay, so um, so, so these are, are the running ports, yeah, and we can look at the, their statuses. If I click on maybe something more interesting, yeah, recommendation service, you know, you can look at this is part of this particular requirement, you know, it's created by this replica set um, and it's sitting on this node. So it's, 
So it's running a container as well as the, you know, the, for this particular port itself, the CPU and the, uh, uh, the memory utilization, right? So you can look at what has been requested, which is represented by the, the yellow line here. And then, you know, the limit uh, set by the uh, uh, Kubernetes, so the blue line representing where we are, right? So, so more interestingly, I think if we look at something that is uh, um, in the alerting uh, ring, right? So we can see same kind of thing, but then we see that there is, is alerting because there's a warning and it's probably because this, uh, you know, the, the memory utilized is actually very close to the, um, to the request, right? So we're, we're getting a warning. Um, so, but, you know, if you have a lot of uh, nodes and you have a lot of uh, ports running, right, you know, then you, you want to see how the status of the, the different nodes that are they're running, um, you know, their, their statuses, you know, their CPU utilization for each of the, the ports in a table format, right? But when you have a lot of this, an easier way will be to search for a certain type of deployment, right? So we can search by, um, you know, by deployment name or namespace or node name. So if you're looking to, to understand how a service is uh, performing, looking at the deployment and then looking at some of the services that are there, right? So if I select the catalog service, and I can see that that is running on this node, only on one node, and I can click on that and then look at how that, that node is uh, functioning and what it's actually doing, right? So because this is a, a, um, a, a microservice that is running in there, then I have this additional um, service uh, section that that tracks the, the web transaction and, and and the throughput of the HTTP request. And this is something that is done by, by Pixie, right? Without any, any uh, instrumentation of the, of the uh, service itself, right? So as I mentioned, Pixie can track all these uh, HTTP requests as well as DNS requests across the different, um, different ports, right? And all this information is actually stored on the cluster right, on the Kubernetes cluster itself. But then we send some information back to, uh, to New Relic so that we can then observe the, um, the, the service, you know, uh, over time, right? So if I click on this service detail, so, so this is back now in, in the New Relic UI, right? And, and you can see that's the response time, the throughput and error rate, similar information, but then you have longer term historical data, right? You can then look at the, the transactions that are running, right, the, uh, that, that have been requested, right? As well as things like um, the, the, the database requests, right? So, so all this can be done without any, uh, any manual instrumentation, okay? So if I go back to the summary and then go back to the uh, Kubernetes cluster. So, so let's look at some live debugging with Pixie, right? So, um, so as I mentioned, Pixie sits on the uh, Kubernetes cluster. So now we can look at, um, you know, real time uh, debugging of, uh, of what's going on between the, the ports and the end within the Kubernetes cluster. Right, so again, you know, by without any uh, instrumentation, right, uh, we can see the different um, services within the ports that are calling each other. So I've got this PX sock shop, the front end making calls to the, um, making calls to like the, the catalog service, right, uh, making calls to the, the DNS, no, no, no DNS call, but you know, um, the user service, the cards, and so on, right? Okay. Um, and, and then the, the lines here represent the, you know, the, uh, the number of requests as well as the, the response time, looking at P50 and then P90 and, and the uh, error percentage, right? 
Okay, so building the service map um, in, in uh, live with, with what we call Pixie scripts, right? And you can do a lot of things, which I'm going to show you uh, in a bit later, right? But now we're looking at the cluster, and if we scroll down, we can look at you know what's going on with the nodes, the CPU utilization, uh, the different namespaces, um, yeah, the average size, and and the uh, resident set sizes, you know, all the different namespaces. And then all the services that are running within this uh, cluster, right? So I showed you earlier on the, um, let's just make this a bit bigger. So look, looking for this uh, catalog service that I saw earlier on. Right, so you can see all the, um, all the requests going into this, uh, um, so this inbound traffic, all the requests going into this uh, um, catalog service, you know, from the front end, right? The HTTP request, the HTTP error, and, and, and their latency, okay? Um, and what ports they're running on, okay? And then, and then looking at uh, some samples of a slow request, right? So if I click on one of these, you know, I can then look at that, that particular request and understand, you know, the, uh, you know, the byte reads and the byte return, the, the network send and, and receive, the CPU utilization, um, the throughput, HTTP throughput errors and, and latency as well for this particular request. So the other very interesting part about uh, Pixie is this uh, flame graph, right? So, so this flame graph essentially provide the uh, the execution path through the um, um, through the kernel, right? So what you are seeing here, you know, the the dark blue area represent the um, you know the namespace and basically the Kubernetes uh, uh, components, right? And and the light blue represent the um, you know the uh, user user code, right? So these are the the catalog service and, and the the function that is calling, right? And essentially, what we're looking for here are the uh, are things like hotspot, right? Looking at the width of the of the uh, of each of these uh, uh, function, right? Um, and where they are spending time, um, you know, utilizing CPU to uh, to perform perform this work, right? And on the other hand, we can also look at the, the green area, which are actually uh, kernel code itself, right? Okay. So, so you know, um, Pixie gives you very uh, deep, deep information into what is going on in the kernel, um, how the application is actually using, using the, uh, the um, you know, the operating system resources. Okay, if we kind of move further uh, up and look at some of the other scripts that we can do with uh, with uh, Pixie. So, you know, so this is looking at the port, right? We can look at, um, say, the DNS flow graph, right? So looking at requests to, uh, uh, to the DNS, right? So here you can see the, the Kube DNS uh, system, right? Um, and then you know which which function or which service is making a DNS call to help us troubleshoot um, you know DNS issues, right? So we can see from different entities to the uh, uh, you know to the uh, DNS, the latency, and and the count, right? Okay. Um, as well as things like um, maybe. Kafka data, maybe um, database data, right? Okay, so looking at the table of, uh, you know, the database request from this source to this destination, you know, um, the, the SQL, as well as the, uh, you know, looking at the latency, right? And, and the result sets that we're getting Checking if there's any questions on the on the session. A 
Okay, so um, you know, in terms of the workshop, I'm going to uh, uh, pause here and and kind of uh, conclude, right? I think we are almost um, out of time, so I'm going to switch back to my uh, my slides and kind of uh, talk about you know what I've just shown you, right? So. So what I've shown you with the different UI, talking about Pixie, trans distributed trace, Lambda, and all those things. All, all these are, are what we call dashboards or workflow uh, from the new Relic observability platform, right? So, so the platform is, is built on the idea that we want to be able to instrument um, anything, right? Or everything, you know, kind of, and, and be able to view all this data in, in one place, whether it's data from, you know, the our agents, which you see what's on the left, as well as any telemetry data that you know that gets emitted by cloud native services, whether it's from you know uh, monitoring tools like Prometheus, Telegraph, you know StatsD, um, distributed tracing standards like Open Telemetry, um, you know logs like uh, FluentD and, and Logstash, right? So you know putting them all together in, into one one UI that I, I show you rather than having you know, um, developers or, or engineers having to flip between multiple tools, right? You know, and, you know, and especially in, in, in emergencies when they have a urgent problem to solve, you know, it, it, it makes troubleshooting and, and decision-making so, so much easier when you have everything in, in one place, right? Um, and what New Relic is doing, right? Um, you know, we, we, we're trying to get all this data into one platform, right? Um, it's, it's actually a, a, a massive task, right? But we try to make it as easy, as simple as possible for, for, for engineers and, and, and developers, right? And, and to do that, we, we kind of provide a, a very simple and, and transparent pricing model that is, is, is based um, only on on the data ingested and the number of users using our the workflow that, that I've shown you, right? Um, you know, that there is no counting of the number of holes, the number of serverless function in, invoked, you know, or all the types of inf instrumentation that, you know, that developers or engineers want to use, right? So they, they can free, to, they're free to choose whatever data they want to ingest that is needed for their, you know, for the service, for the applications that they are developing or or, or, or monitoring, right? Um, so a, a, as little friction as possible. But the other great part of this uh, of this is that we have a what we call a, a perpetually uh, free tier um, a license that you know anybody can can sign up, and you can sign up um, without uh, having to to input a a credit card, right? And it provides you with hundred gigabyte of, uh, of data that you can ingest per month, right? And, you know, for that, um, for that simple calculator service that I show you, you know, that can, that work can actually be done kind of for free, totally free with, uh, with New Relic free tier, as well as with, uh, you know, I did it on, on AWS. So there is a free tier there as well that you can use. And there's actually hardly any cost to actually, um, you know, um, come up with that uh, um, that sample application that I, I demoed in this workshop, right? So essentially, you know, engineering teams and developers, you know, they can explore their software, you know, learn about observability and, and, and therefore build much greater software, right? So, um, yeah, I'm gonna see if there's any questions. So I don't see any questions. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and and wrap up here. So I hope I've given you some useful information about how you can observe what's powering your API. So um, enjoy the rest of the program and have a great day. <laughs>